Good evening. Welcome to the Education Plan Committee meeting for Wednesday, March 29, 2023. I'm Trustee Preeti Fritkot, and I would like to call the meeting to order. Please join me in acknowledging that we are unlearning and relearning on the traditional and unceded lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. The meeting is being live streamed and the audio and visual recordings will also be will be available to the public for viewing after the meeting. The footage of the meeting may be viewed inside and outside of Canada. The board has a strong commitment to ethical con conduct. This includes the responsibility of committee members to conduct uh, themselves with appropriate decorum and professionalism. As chair of the committee, it is my responsibility to see that decorum is maintained. Following presentations, information items, there will be an opportunity to ask questions for clarification purposes. I ask trustee members and stakeholder representatives to keep comment to the content provided in the presentations report. Before we begin, I will go around the room and if everyone could introduce themselves for the roll call, starting on my left with uh, Allison Ogden, Director of Instruction. Uh, David Green, Secretary of Treasurer. Arabella Mew from VDSC. Louis Champedley, Trustee and Committee Member. Alva Chin, Trustee. Uh, Josh Zhang, Trustee and Committee Member. Eric Brew, Vase. Carmen Shadley, Vancouver Secondary. Brigitte Bjorn, Vetfa. Erica Jade Mulheron, PASA. Hilary Watt, VASA. Christopher Richardson, trustee, alternative, but I'm just observing tonight. Kayanta Martins, DPAC. Jennifer Reddy, trustee, committee member. Susie Ma, trustee. Rob Schindel, associate superintendent, education services. Eva Chow, recorder. Yeah, David Nelson, deputy superintendent. Sorry, uh, Marisa Dikiakos, QP15. Janet Fraser, trustee. Victoria Young, trustee. Sorry, <laughs> Peter Silva, Associate Superintendent. Helen McGregor, Superintendent. Pete Newidge, Associate Superintendent. Brandon Morishita, District Principal, SEL, Mental Health and Wellbeing. Rosie Petchko, Director of Instruction Learning Services. Thank you, everyone. We will now move to agenda section number one, items for approval. There is no items for approval on the agenda for tonight. We will now move to agenda section two, discussion items. There are no discussion items on the agenda for tonight as well. We will now move to agenda section number three, information items. We have three information items on the agenda for this evening. The first is, is updated district calendar submission for 2023-24, 2024-25, and 2025-26. I will turn that over to Alison Ogden, Director of Instructions. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Uh, so as you can see from the memo in the package, uh, the first week of February, uh, our provincial government uh, chose to make the uh, Day for Truth and Reconciliation a statutory holiday here in the province of British Columbia. So this is just an updated calendar that recognizes that date. Uh, for the 2023-2024 school year, we'll be recognizing that day on Monday, October 2nd, uh, and that was a recommendation that came through federally as well. To, to have some alignment. In addition, uh, a number of other metro school districts had uh, put forth their calendars and there was some uh, discrepancies between our calendars and our surrounding metro districts in terms of when we were gonna honor uh, Remembrance Day, which 
falls on a Saturday. Uh, in the previous calendar that was submitted to this committee in January, it was being recognized on the Friday. Uh, but to be in alignment with other metropolitan metro districts, we are uh, moving it to the Monday, uh, which is the November 13th. Uh, well, not in the information for the committee, um, looking at the hours of instruction, knowing that that day uh, will be a, a day of non-work and non-instruction for students, we are still meeting the minimum number of instructional hours for both secondary uh, and elementary for next year and moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Are there any questions related to the presentation or to Allison. Okay, seeing none. Um, the next um, information item on the agenda is education plan update, social emotional learning. I will turn that over to uh, Rosie, Director of Instruction and Brandon Morshida, District Principal. Thank you. Thank you everyone and good evening. It's an absolute pleasure to be here tonight to speak about mental health and social emotional learning and supports uh, for our students within the district. My name is Rosie Petchka. I'm Director of Instruction for Learning Services. I support all of our students in the district with special and diverse needs as well as our mental health portfolio, our social um, emotional learning portfolio and safe and caring schools. I'll pass it over to Brandon for a quick introduction. Good evening, everyone. Oh, my name again is Brandon Morishita, uh, District Principal of SEL Mental Health and Wellbeing. Um, I came over from, from Douglas Elementary in November, um, where I was a school-based administrator uh, principal there. And prior to that, I was at the vice principal at Secord Elementary. So happy to be here and, and continuing the great work that's been done the past few years. Thank you, everyone. So tonight we'll be speaking a little bit about uh, supports in schools for mental health and social emotional learning, as well as a mental health in schools strategy, as well as some of the ongoing work um, being undertaken in the district to support mental health and social emotional learning for our students um, and our staff. Mental health promotion is a key driver for the mental health in school strategy. Ooh. I'll, maybe I'll just pop to the agenda quick. Uh, so tonight we'll be talking about mental health in schools, the strategy, the ongoing work to support mental health and well-being, information used to guide decisions and planning and looking forward. And you can move to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so a couple of pieces um, around the mental health and school strategies. The, the strategy has been in place for a couple of years now, coming up to three years in September. And it um, has been a live and working document. Um, there have been updates to it along the way. Um, but one of the key pieces is, is that it lays out a very clear framework for supporting students uh, within the district and supporting staff within the district. And while social emotional learning and mental health are not the same, Social emotional learning can be seen um, and is a way to promote positive mental health in many ways by promoting responsive relationships, emotionally safe environments for learning, skills development. Uh, social emotional learning cultivates important sort of protective factors to buffer against mental health risks. And in this way, social emotional learning is an ind indispensable part of student mental health and wellness, um, helps to improve attitudes amongst uh, about self and about others, um, while also decreasing emotional stress. The mental health in school strategy um, is um, uh, formulated and made up of a number of key pieces and I'll speak to each of those. Firstly, a pathway to hope, which was released by the Ministry of uh, Mental Health and Addictions and Safe and uh, Safe Schools under the ERASE strategy, uh, were used to inform uh, the development um, uh, for the mental health in schools strategy. And the strategy outlines these three pillars. And if we could go to the next, oh, sorry, sorry, if we could go back one slide, apologies. Uh, the first pillar just at the bottom there is compassionate systems leadership and compassionate and compassionate systems leadership is an approach that inspires transformative teaching 
and invites educators to consider new ways, uh, new ways of learning, new ways of supporting students, new ways of delivering curriculum. Um, and in that, in, embedded in that is compassion within the work that is done. The second pillar um, is capacity building and refers to both the growth um, of personal capacity as well as capability within the school, the district, and the overall sort of system capacity that we hold. And the third pillar is mental health in the classroom. And mental health influences all aspects of our classroom and our school environment uh, from student learning and student behavior to student success. And the best learning we know is rooted in relationships and the, the redesign curriculum, which, which is now quite, quite a few years um, into, um, into uh, delivery into schools, uh, was developed to honor the safe uh, and um, nurturing, caring environment for our little ones. Next slide, please. I wanted to highlight a couple again of the key uh, principles um, and the mental health in school strategy. Um, cultural responsiveness and humility is one of the key principles and it is a very important piece of supporting our learners within our school. Uh, proportionate responses and supports is another piece that helps to um, helps to ensure that we have um, uh, processes and pieces in place to support within schools. Trauma-informed practice, for which Brandon will speak to some of the work that we've been doing, as well as strengths-based approaches um, to help to ensure that what we are, what we are um, teaching our little ones and what they are learning is uh, very much um, based on uh, practices that we know um, hold true for our students. Uh, again, these four key principles apply to all elements within the mental health and school strategy, and we're intended to provide a general framework for planning and implementing um, uh, processes within the school system. If I could have the next slide, please. Perfect. Um, and so within both of the documents, so within both the mental health and school strategy document and the key principles document, um, mental health promotion is a key driver for the work. And this diagram shows the intersection between the BC education system and our community ministry partners. We've shown this before um, at previous um, meetings and it still is very, very applicable to the work that is being done both within schools and within our partner agencies. Uh, the first triangle at the bottom, highlights the work undertaken in schools. And you can see the vast majority of the work undertaken in schools is that mental health promotion piece. And when we look at the flip side, the converse side, the, our community and ministry partners, the vast majority of their work is done in intervention um, and intervention um, approaches. Um, in, um, in connection together, we both have prevention and that's work that we do together. And that's part of the work that our mental health um, and social emotional learning team do together. Um, but coming together um, and working together throughout these pieces is critical and crucial for our students and for learning. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Brandon, who will talk about our next slides. Thanks, Rosie. We can go to the next slide. Um, so in order to cultivate uh, system-wide well-being, uh, the Stetsiel Mental Health and Well-Being team continue to offer um, numerous professional development opportunities to support compassion system leadership. Uh, these opportunities allow our staff to be better equipped so they can support the students that they work with in the areas of mental health literacy, mental wellness, social emotional learning. Next slide. So over the, over the years, District Learning Services ha, um, have offered numerous professional development opportunities on many topics, including social emotional learning and mental health. Uh, these opportunities are offered to staff that directly support students in our schools. That's teachers, support staff, office staff, and administrators. On the screen um, provides some opportunities that we recently offered, um, but I kind of want to just um, touch on about three of them. Uh, during our February 17th Pro D Day, Angela Murphy presented on reframing, reframing complex trauma and behaviors through a developmental lens. She shared how trauma impacts the brain uh, and body in the seven areas of development that are often impacted for our students who've been in, who've been through difficult situations. Angela introduced a framework for how to calm the nervous system for ourselves and for our students and left us with 10 ways to how to de-escalate students big behaviors through a trauma-focused lens. Uh, this work this workshop 
reinforced how to build compassionate learning environments, allowing both students and staff to thrive. We had a, we, we offered it out. Angela took it up about 200 people um, for her workshop, uh, and it was filled 200 within the first two weeks. So we'll be looking next year at what we can do to increase that number. Uh, another opportunity that I want to highlight is our trauma focused schools workshop that we promote. Uh, this is a seven hour self paced online course um, that we offer in our district. Uh, we continue to receive very positive feedback and interest from staff who provide direct service to our students. And so we've opened up more spots this year uh, to recruit to create more opportunities for staff to register. Uh, last year we had about 600 people registered. Um, and as of today, over 1,000 staff have completed or are currently enrolled in, in the course. So we're very excited about that. Um, and last last year, our team worked with the Merit Center and Dr. Stuart Shanker uh, to provide self-regulation training to all our staff. Uh, we are now very excited to share that we now have a cohort, uh, which includes classroom teachers, counselors, SSAs, SSBs, uh, resource teachers, um, who all be enrolled in the self-regulation foundations one certificate program. Uh, this is an eight month intensive program with four courses that explores the science of regulation and stress, including how the body, brain and stress system works and how stress affects children's behavior and moods, the difference between misbehavior and stress behavior and the importance of relationships in self regulation and learning. Next slide, please. The so now next look at the professional development opportunities um, that are offered really support staff to build capacity around mental health literacy and mental health promotion. Uh, the SC, our SEL team mental health team have curated and provided many resources that staff can use directly to our students. Next slide. So just here's just the list of some of the things that we have offered throughout the, the school year this year. Uh, one very important resource that I want to talk about touch base on is our SEL SharePoint. Um, this is a, a um, a SharePoint online for all our staff that has resources, lesson plans, videos. For example, one of our SEL 101s from our district uh, SEL teacher will be on here and uh, through a video on how to integrate SEL strategies into classroom routines. Um, our district S resource teacher also collaborates daily with teachers in our schools, in our, in our, in our, in our schools to model and show best practice on how to Im implement SEL practices. She also provides lunch and learns, manages and organizes um, SEL leads meetings and offers many pro D opportunities throughout the district. Uh, we've all, we're also in the process of creating a kindergarten to grade 12 SEL mental health resource guide, and we'll be in the, in the midst in the next few months sending that out to all our schools uh, to start the new school year. We're also currently uh, collaborating with multiple departments this year um, in, our, in our district to support the diversity, equity, inclusion youth conference. This event is uh, planned uh, by our youth for our youth and will happen in person this year on April 27th at the Jewish Community Center. This year's focus is going to be self and community care and healing. Uh, finally, I'm going to touch base on the mental health education and child care provides us funding to support mental health to provide mental health in schools each year, which focuses on, as Rosie said, compassion system leadership, capacity building and mental health in classrooms through trauma informed practice and a cultural responsive lens. Carrying on from our work last year, uh, our district SEL mental health team, mental health and well-being team are creating SEL nature kits and SEL indigenous educational enhancement worker kits um, that will be distributed to all elementary and secondary schools um, in the next few months. Next slide. These are just some of the, the kits that we work through with our indigenous education department. Um, we with our team. Um, we gathered a bunch of information just from um, other districts uh, and our indigenous, indigenous, indigenous education leads uh, and came up with um, a bunch of resources, books, activities that we can use, put them all together. And this is what we've come up with. Uh, these will all be going out to every indigenous enhancement worker um, in our district. Next slide. And then this is just another another a bunch of uh, storybooks that we'll be sending uh, to each elementary school, to all 88 elementary schools in our district. Um, we've just placed the order just before spring break, so hopefully that will come soon um, and they'll be all distributed um, within the next month. Next slide. Finally, and this is our secondary nature kits that will be going out to all our secondary schools. 
Next slide, please. So we continue to work with other teams and departments to embed Indian's knowledge and perspective throughout all learning environments. Next slide. So this is just a list of programs, tools uh, that support educators that are that, that the educators are using to support social emotional learning and mental health in the classroom. In collaboration with our Indigenous Education Department, we have now built and some schools have now received Indigenous Healing Gardens, uh, hold, Healing Holistic Gardens. Uh, this initiative will provide the opportunity for both students and staff to engage and learn through four holistic developmental domains, emotional, physical, intellectual, and spiritual. Currently, we have 16 boxes that are created over nine schools. And our next step right now is to organize a ceremonial blessing uh, for each of the gardens alongside our educational department. Uh, finally, I'll talk about Open Parachute. Uh, Open Parachute is a mental health and well-being platform uh, that is av available for teachers in grades that teach kindergarten to grade 12. Each grade uh, has approximately five units with 45 lessons embedded into it. Uh, students view teacher led videos on mental health and well-being, and each lesson is based around a documentary uh, of videos that showcase real that showcase you sharing their own experiences, overcoming struggle. Uh, but this is a teacher led platform that our teachers using in our elementary and secondary schools. Next slide. So where do we go from here? The big so the big question that we want to ask ourselves is how do we know what we're doing is making a difference? So currently we're using three tools uh, to gather the evidence. We look at information from the MDI, YDI, and student learning surveys. Middle MDI is middle development instrument, uh, youth development instrument, and the student learning survey, but also accessing street data level uh, that we get from our staff, students, and families in our district. Next slide. So I'll talk a little bit about the middle years development instrument. Uh, this is a self-reported questionnaire that asks children about their, their thoughts and feelings uh, and experiences in schools uh, and in the community. Uh, this year, the VSB is administering the, the MDI to grade six students, as in the past, we've, we've um, administered this to grade sevens. The MDI quest, uh, questions focus on five areas of development that are strongly linked to well-being, health, and academic achievement. They will ask questions regarding physical health, health and well-being, social emotional development, use of after school time, school experience and connectedness. Results from the MDI are used to understand the factors that promote social emotional learning or social emotional health and well-being. Next slide. The YDI is actually new to our to our schools this year and it's used for two and we're um, administering that in our secondary schools this year. This is a voluntary self-reported questionnaire that measures the health and well-being of our grade 11 students in BC. The YDI looks at five different areas, uh, social emotional learning, learning environment and engagement, social well-being, physical and mental well-being, um, and navigating the world. Uh, the, uh, the YDI also added one other component this year uh, and asked use about the impacts of COVID-19. Uh, the MDI, the MDI and YDI both closed recently. Uh, the MDI closed three weeks ago, and the YDI closed today. Act today, um, so we will be working with uh, UBC and SFU in the coming months, alongside the Human Early Development Learning Pro Department, uh, to gather those results. Um, once the results, usually the results results usually come in around mid-May. Um, this will then allow administrators and schools to interpret their their own schools' results and data. Uh, this data can then be shared verbally to staff and the school community through PAC meetings and, and staff meetings as no names are, are attached to this document. It will also be give us the district a good idea where strengths and needs are when planning for next school year. Next slide. Finally, we'll talk about the student learning surveys. Uh, this is an annual survey administered to BC public schools for students in grades 4, 7, 10 and 12. Uh, it's the only source of provincial wide information on students experiences in, in a school environment. Uh, the student learning survey is open to students, parents and school staff from January 3rd and closes on April 28th of this of this month or of next month. Uh, the survey is about 30 minutes long to complete and it's organized through the provincial ministry of education. Student and staff surveys for the student learning survey are in English and French. 
uh, but this, the parent surveys are available in 18 different languages. Next slide. So what's next? Um, we addressing SEL and mental health and teaching SEL and mental health literacy have been a focus in our schools. And now more than ever, it is critical that we continue to make it a priority based on the information that we've collected through the MDI, the YDI, the student learning surveys and street data collected from our staff, students and families. We will continue to examine areas of strengths and areas that require attention in the future. Next slide. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Rosie and Brandon. Are there any questions related to the presentation? Trustee Louise John Pedley. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have a question about the um, MDI and YDI and the, the survey. Um, wondering if uh, there are like bigger trends um, that we would be able to get from that data to look at how, because um, you mentioned it's it's like so you, we get school based data. Um, it, are there like district wide data that we can look at? Can we look at other districts for comparison? Um, what kind of information can we get from it? Through the chair to trustee Chen Pedley. Uh, that's a fabulous question. Um, uh, I'll give you an example of a question on the MDI. So one of the questions on the MDI for students in grade four is how connected or do you feel to your school or is there a trusted adult that you feel connected to in your school? And for many folks, that's a really, really important question. Um, and that um, helps to guide and have a better understanding for us as a school district, not only from individual schools, but from the district. So when we get that information in May, we'll be able to look and see what, for example, percentage of students feel connected to the school or have a trusted adult in their school. And there are similar questions within the YDI. Um, and so when we are able to get all those pieces together, it will help to formulate for our schools and for many of our schools for their growth plans. Many of our schools have uh, social emotional learning or mental health as part of their school growth plans that will help to formulate um, uh, next steps for schools in that way. Um, as a district, we do get district data um, and we are able to access uh, provincial data to a certain degree and certain level uh, for other districts within the province. We, we aren't able to gather information on specific schools within other districts in the province, but we are able to gather information um, from other districts within the province. And we always do a comparison and, and have a look at that piece. Trustee Richardson. Thank you so much. Um, I'm wondering in terms of the the um, participation rate of some of these surveys are are voluntary and there are other surveys that some that are isn't a, a huge pickup or there is pickup that is very variable in terms of certain schools and, and otherwise and real because of the possible use. But we won't talk about Fraser Institute. Um, do we you know, I think it's important that we have as robust participation as possible. Is that something that that you are working towards so that there isn't a so that we are getting good data that that then will inform um, our growth plans and other things? Thank you through the chair to trustee Richardson. Um, I couldn't agree more. Um, having um, a good set of, uh, of data or a good number of schools participate is, is crucial and important. We have raised the number of schools or the number of schools participating has increased this year over last year. At, um, in our elementary schools, we had um, seven schools not participate, which is actually an increase over last year. Um, and as the YDI is new this year, um, we have a, a couple of secondary schools that did not participate this year, but the vast majority have. Um, and considering it's a new survey, we're quite excited by that uh, piece. Please go ahead, Marissa. Um, 
I was just curious, uh, you mentioned that you sent several um, um, people through training for um, on, on uh, self-regulation, which is something that me as an SSW is very interested in and was wondering if that training will be made available to other um, uh, through either ProD or other um, other SSWs or B SSBs. Thank you. Thank you for the question through the chair to um, Marissa. Yes, we absolutely will continue to offer um, those sessions, both the seven hour session as well as the other sessions, uh, pro sessions on trauma informed practice. Um, we really um, have recognized the uptake has been quite significant and there's been quite a demand for it. So we are in the works and Brandon and his team are in the works for planning and securing um, speakers for next year, as well as um, an increased number of um, opportunities for the seven hour uh, self paced course. Deepa Kayenta. Thank you. Um, so at the stakeholder budget meeting uh, a couple of months ago or a month and a half ago, um, we heard from a number of um, employers of VSB or employees of VSB that they didn't find the mental health toolkits as useful as they would say more counselors in schools. Um, and so I was wondering if that one, if that feedback had reached you and if there was consideration of putting that money that was being put into mental health toolkits, perhaps for more counselors in schools. Um, and as well, if that feedback is there, is there training that goes along with the mental health toolkits on how to use them or? Thank you through the chair to Kayenta. Um, the mental health toolkits were funded from the mental health grant that we received from the ministry. Um, and there were, there were parameters around that um, and staffing was not something that we were able to use uh, for that funding. And as such, we used it for the toolkits. All of the uh, counselors that received toolkits did receive training from uh, staff at Learning Services. However, we are more than happy um, and we are always more than happy to do more training for uh, counselors or any staff that use those toolkits. Um, from our understanding, the feedback has been that they've been very, very useful um, and very helpful. Um, they sort of provide a snapshot of available resources and supports for schools um, and ones that are appropriate for um, you know elementary, secondary age students, um, as well as the um, uh, Indigenous toolkits as well. Trust you ready? Did you have your hand up? Are you sure? Okay. Um, thanks, Chair. And thanks, uh, Rosie and Brendan, for your presentation. I have a couple questions, so feel free to come back to me. Um, if you could just share a little bit with us about how our students, either at the secondary, like adult or alternative school level, made aware of some of the supports that you mentioned, um, but also how our elementary kids reached with the kinds of support that you mentioned. Thank you through the chair to trustee ready. Um, at, the, at the secondary level, it would be through their school counselors, so the counselors, um, or through grade level or uh, subject level teachers. But for the majority of uh, supports for students in secondary, it is through their counselors um, at the school site. Um, that applies the same at elementary. Our area counselors do a lot of one-on-one -on -one classroom teaching, individual um, um, supports for students. Um, at the elementary level, uh, a little bit more so through the school-based administrator. So many of the school-based administrators at, at elementary Entry schools will um, um, uh, do whole school or whole group um, assemblies or teaching in that way. But at both grades, it is through the counselors. They, they are the primary um, sort of conduit for um, uh, passing along information to students. Carmen. Yes, thank you for all of the work that you're doing um, in this area. Um, so you mentioned uh, professional development opportunities and um, which is great, um, but I'm just wondering if you have, <clears throat> sorry, um, looked into or thought it considered um, in service training as well. So for our teachers, we have faced a significant amount of change, secondary school teachers. We've had, I mean, been through COVID, we had the quarter system and now we're on the semester system. And so that 
amounts to an incredible amount of work for teachers to constantly be changing their practice. Also, we have the new reporting order, we have the first people's courses. So there is a huge demand on teachers for their professional development. It would be great if we could have in-service training for something like this, which is so important because you mentioned the three pillars and you talked about transformative teaching. Teachers need the time to learn to do that. And professional development really just isn't enough. Um, we do need in-service. So I'm just wondering if that is something that has been considered. Thank you through the chair to uh, Carmen. Uh, thank you for that. Um, we will take that away and, and consider that piece for sure. Thank you. Eric? Thank you through the chair and thank you for the presentation. Um, yeah, uh, just to, as a, on a personal note, I very much appreciated the open parachute program as a grade six, seven teacher. It really reaches that exact level of uh, mental health, which is they're a hard to reach group for grade six, seven. Um, as well, it was nice to see the uptake of the trauma informed and mental health workshops uh, among personnel. Uh, I guess my question is that many teachers and counselors are reporting that uh, the school counselors at the elementary level are being frequently pulled to work as TTOCs to fill in coverage and as a result, are unable to meet the mental health needs um, or if they do have the time to meet them are unable to meet their students frequently enough to actually form um, a working connection uh, between themselves and the students. Uh, and I remember in our inaugural meeting, perhaps it was in September, this um, student trustee brought up the fact at, fact at the secondary level that um, students were facing enormous wait times in order to see their school counselors. So I guess my question is, um, what can be done to address uh, the situation where counselors are being pulled uh, from their critical role as frontline uh, mental health practitioners um, into a TTOC kind of coverage filling role? Thank you. Thank you through the chair to Eric. Uh, thank you for um, uh, that that piece. Um, I will connect in with our um, employee services department um, and get back to you with more information. Trust you ready? Thanks, Chair. Yeah, I just had a second question just around like how you mentioned the differences in prevention and intervention and when there are like significant uh, heightened crises. I was just curious like what kind of policies or procedures are enacted in order to follow through when a student is experiencing a crisis in mental health. Um, if you could share a little bit about how that's um, handled in a school setting. Thank you through the chair to trustee ready. Um, each situation is unique and it really depends on the student, the age of the student, uh, the grade level of the student. Um, but ultimately at the end of the day, um, it's connecting in with their families first and foremost um, and, um, and then accessing outside supports and very often helping families access outside supports. As we all know, there, there can be significant wait lists for outside supports in the community, whether it's pediatricians or whether it's mental health supports um, or whether whether it's just receiving an intake or an assessment. So very often a lot of the work that we do in schools is helping families to navigate that, but also helping to support um, families as they go through that process as well to help to support their, their, their children. Uh, Pete. Uh, through the chair, thank you. I just wanted to address the the um, uh, Eric's earlier comment regarding um, uh, TTOC uh, uh, counselors being pulled to cover TTOCs, etc. Um, you know, happy to report that uh, while we do on occasion uh, have days when we are not uh, filling all TTOC assignments, uh, currently we're actually in, in a very good place with that. Um, so happy to report that as schools are looking at filling TTOC absences or sorry, teacher absences with TTOCs um, 
for for the vast majority of days recently, we've been able to do that uh, with very little exception. Um, so certainly would like to report to the group here that we are moving in a very good direction there. Um, and so certainly just wanted that to be sort of a part of the conversation here in that uh, where we've had to pull teachers, non enrolling counselors, et cetera, uh, previously uh, to, to a higher degree, we are certainly moving away from that as a district. So that's a good news story. Are there any more questions? Carmen? Uh, that was really great news to hear um, from uh, Associate Superintendent. Um, so just to clarify, does that mean that we sh should expect to not be hearing about that happening anymore or just, I guess I'm just wondering to what degree that's not going to be happening anymore. Um, just because I, I mean, of course, our members ask about that. So, yeah, through through the chair to you, Carmen. I'm certainly uh, my hope would be that it's not an ongoing issue. Uh, certainly, I can't predict the future, and a lot of the um, uh, our ability to fill jobs or not is driven by a number of factors, including um, you know number of absences, when absences are reported, distribution of absences, etc. Um, um, that information often comes to the personnel committee uh, through various times of the year. Um, but certainly, our hope would be that we're possible. We're not pulling on enrolling teachers to fill uh, assignments, and as I mentioned previously, um, we are moving in a good direction there. Uh, recently. Hillary. Thank you through the chair. I just want to follow up on Trustee Reddy's comment asking about um, supporting students when there is a crisis and I just wanted to bring up the really important work that our school based teams do in a really collaborative way um, meeting at least one once a month and bringing together that brain trust of people within the school and um, uh, I've personally found that to be very effective and often involves admin, resource teachers, counselors, and so really pooling as many resources as possible, not just for our academic concerns, but also students struggling. Trustee Mo. Yeah, I have a question. Um, how does this work relate or connect with the Safe and Caring Schools group? Thank you through the chair to Trustee Ma. Uh, Safe and Caring Schools um, and our mental health team uh, and social emotional learning team do connect on a, on a frequent basis. Um, particularly when there is a um, an emergent situation with a student um, or within a school-based setting. Uh, the work is very different in many ways um, in terms of the the team themselves. So the team at Safe and Caring Schools um, has the district principal Iqbal Gill as well as nine SSBs that support directly in secondary schools. So the Safe and Caring Schools department is primarily for our secondary schools. Uh, they do not support in elementary schools in that way. Um, but that is where the work of Brandon and his team support in the elementary. But at the secondary level, there is overlapping connection at times when there is an emergent need for uh, to, to support a student. Thank you. Any more questions? OK. All right, we can move ahead. Uh, the final information item on the agenda is reporting order update. I will turn that over to uh, Pedro De Silva, Associate Superintendent, Educational Services. Good evening, everybody. Two, two important moments. I think this is the Ed Plan Committee. Uh, Committee. Um, and two, this will be probably people who work me the shortest slide presentation of my entire life. There's one slide. And um, part of that is because uh, we're, we wanted to just give everyone a bit of a uh, heads up around the reporting order. Um, just some high level context. We will be coming back uh, to this group with a more detailed um, report, but it would be important just to share the following. Um, so we've been in the, we, we say new curriculum, it's actually the curriculum since 2016. Uh, when that curriculum was established, there's a little emphasis on core competencies and 
the proficiency standards and assessing students as they go through their uh, learning journey. There's a lot of work done with the First Peoples principals. And in September of 2021 to November 2021, the Ministry of Education wanted to do a review. So they did an extensive feedback uh, or an outreach to the, the public to take a look at the report area order and take a look at generally how the, um, the, the curriculum was going. During that consultation, they received feedback from uh, the public and the following groups, they're not exclusive, there are other groups, but the BCTF, uh, the BC Cotton Federation of Parent Advisory Council, the First Nations Education Steering Committee, the BC Principals and Vice Principals Association, and the BC Superintendent Association. And out of that feedback from the Ministry of Education was a new reporting order. And it's been in development uh, for a little, a little while. Uh, it's still in draft. And so the interesting thing is in draft, but the implementation will actually happen this September. And so schools will have to adopt it. We anticipate that the draft will be done later um, prior to the summer, but we, we're working closely in ministry to find out when that will take place. The purpose of this update is to let you know that there is some work that's ongoing right now with uh, our elementary and our secondary groups around the reporting order. Um, you know, I can share at this time, it is in draft that one of the impacts will be, for example, at the elementary, that there will be three formal um, reporting periods and two informal sessions. And at the secondary level, there will be, in each semester, there'll be two formal and one informal. But the work in those community uh, groups is ongoing. And, um, you know, I think there's, uh, in that group, there's about nine representatives that has teachers and also administrators. Uh, to be able to uh, sometime in the spring or um, or even could be throughout the summer where the schools will communicate out to the students or families in the PACs what will be the reporting um, order. One of the things I think that for us um, that I could share for you, we do really want to be as, uh, we want the experience around the reporting order to be as consistent as possible. Like we want students in each of our schools to be able to, and families to be seeing reporting, uh, reporting is coming out at similar times in similar ways so that we have some equitable kind of approaches to them. I also want to share that we are working closely with the ministry. We are having some folks from the ministry come to talk to our administrators in April, um, just around questions and answers to make sure that we can, uh, you know, do this in an appropriate way. And one of the privileges I have in jobs like this is I get to speak here, but really the work's being done by the people who are in those groups. Um, and also Chris uh, Wong and um, Aaron Davis and Krista Edger, who are actually doing a lot of the heavy lifting. Um, we did think it was important to just bring this to the attention, just to give you a sense of the flow, acknowledging that there will be a more detailed report coming. Um, and I just, uh, yeah, and I'm here to take any questions at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Pedro. Are there any questions? Carmen? Yeah, th uh, thank you for that. Um, yeah, so our teachers who are involved in that working group have, have talked about what a, a good experience that it has been, um, and they really appreciate that opportunity to be involved in that. Um, so I'm just wondering, so the work that they've done so far, um, is there a next level of review? So what comes out of that working group? Will another group of people kind of remove from that group, then look at it and make changes, or could we expect it to be pretty similar to what that group has come up with? Yeah, through the chair. Yeah, it's a really good question. We, we're in this kind of interesting thing where it's a draft document and we want it to be finalized. And I think if changes come up, we would for sure be working with that group. The conversation with that work group is, is, part, is related to the reporting order, but the, clearly the reporting order is going to be tied into assessment and different conversations. And so I think those are always conversations that we want to absolutely engage with our teachers and you know stakeholders and because it's really important to do that. So from our perspective, this is an ongoing process. Um, what we do need to iron out though will be more of the formal reporting dates and what's happening next year in the school community and that we want to iron out as quickly as possible. Are there any other questions?
Thank you. Now moving to information item requests. We have no previous information item requests for this evening. Committee members may request by email to the chair of the committee, follow up information on previously discussed items and or suggest pos possible topics for future committee meetings agendas. All requests for future agenda items will be considered by the chair and the vice chair at their weekly agenda setting meeting. Thank you everyone. We are adjourned until the next meeting on May 10th, 2023. Oh. Sorry, I thought there was going to be a moment for future items or requests for information. No, does that, did I miss um, that or we don't have that? If, <laughs> if you have any future items, you can okay. send us, uh, okay. send me an email. Okay. And uh, we can we can discuss that in, in our agenda setting meeting. Is there a deadline? Because the next meeting is May 10th. So is there a time that you need to get that in order for you to have time to consider it? Mm -hmm. Two weeks before. Two weeks before. Okay, thank yeah, you. Thank you. Okay, thank you everyone. Thank <laughs> you.